Peacock Alley. This is Gary Emmett with your host, Dale Wetzel. We're broadcasting live tonight. It's Valentine's Day, and Dale and I are out here working away, and I know a couple of our guests um, are away from places they'd rather be, but they're making big sacrifices to be famous on radio they here, could, They could be having expensive meals purchased <laughs> for them at this very moment, Well, and, uh, and here they are with us. Well, and... Um, at Peacock Alley earlier, we were talking about that this they're going to run the tables about three times tonight. And you can take your date out for about 80 bucks, And with that, you get a bottle of wine or champagne. It's a four-course meal. Some of the things on here I can't even pronounce, so I'm not going to try. But I do know that one of the third courses is either prime rib, surf and turf, or honey sesame pork. And I can tell you that prime rib, Dale, that I saw was about a three-pound slab. So it'll be lunch tomorrow and probably even on Saturday. I was going to say it'd probably be lunch for the rest of the week. Yeah, except for guys like me, I'd eat it all. So and then not sleep worth a darn all night. So anyway, tonight this hour is um, sponsored by the North Dakota Ethanol Council. And we're going to be discussing ethanol. This, on Thursday night we talked to the corn growers. The, uh, we've had soybeans and we've talked about the grain growers. And then we kind of rotated this hour and we've been talking ag. So Dale, tonight, uh, before we get into our guest... Um, you want to give us a brief overview of what happened today at the Capitol? There were some interesting discussions going on as I picked up on your reports over KFYR earlier in the day. So maybe you want to give us a couple of highlights for listeners out there. One of the things that happened is the, the House Republicans have uh, come to a preferred uh, state employee pay package. Uh, it is different from what the governor has recommended. The governor governor's recommended essentially a 5% and 5% uh, pay raise. I'm I'm really compressing this in term for simplicity's sake. Five uh, percent this year, five percent next year for state employees. Uh, full funding for their health insurance, which means they do not have to contribute to the cost of their insurance, uh, which uh, is a benefit wow. that's worth about a thousand dollars a month. And also, one uh, percent per year increases uh, in the contributions to the state employee pension fund. And now this it's a two percent per year, but one percent would be paid by the employee, one percent by the state each of this this year and next year. So you have one percent and one percent this year, one percent and one percent next year, split between the state employee and the state government employer. And this is different from the governor's plan. Um, uh, the, that, actually that was the governor's plan that I just mentioned. What House Republicans would prefer, would be to have no additional contribution from the state government employer into the pension fund. In other words, you have the state employee pay the 2% per year this year and next year, that there would be a, uh, basically a 3% and 3% uh, pay raise uh, on, on average, 3% uh, this year, 3% next year instead of 5%. The full funding for the health insurance would be continued. Um, there's often a difference between the House and the Senate on when it comes to state employee compensation. Uh, this will be worked out at the end of the session. But the Senate was uh, pretty solid in, in supporting Governor Dalrymple's uh, pay package, and uh, we'll see how, uh, how strongly each uh, side wants to hold on to their uh, convictions as far as what that should be. Uh, the Senate Republican uh, Majority Leader, uh, uh, Rich Wardner said that a good pay package is essential in terms of keeping state employees at a time when there's quite a bit of competition for labor in North Dakota, particularly for certain jobs in western North Dakota uh, where that translate well into you know going into the oil industry, whether you're working for the highway patrol or if you're driving a, a heavy equipment, uh, the oil industry uh, wants you too and they pay better. So uh, it's um, there's there's a certain element of needing to hang on to, uh, to employees. Uh, on the Senate floor today, there was an extensive debate about an anti-discrimination bill that would have made it illegal to discriminate against uh, people based upon their sexual orientation or their gender identity. Uh, this bill was defeated. Uh, it was passed in the Senate uh, four years ago, so this was a bit of a, a, bit of a surprise that it was defeated. But it will it will be back. We we were um, I was talking earlier to some some folks who were the sponsors of this bill, and they're you know they're going to take uh, this result uh, and and learn from it and move forward, and we'll see uh, what happens in the future. Uh, also, there was a, a rather interesting 
uh, discussion of the proper way to strengthen North Dakota's uh, laws against driving under the influence. The Senate has a bill. The House has a bill. Both of them now uh, include a mandatory jail term uh, or community service in the Senate's uh, uh, version uh, for a first offense uh, driving under the influence. Uh, The House bill, which is the tougher of the two, uh, initially uh, had uh, four days minimum in jail for a first offense conviction for driving under the influence. The Senate bill has a two-day minimum if you have a blood alcohol content of 0.18 or higher. Uh, The legal limit right now is 0.08. So if you have a 0.18 blood alcohol content, you're busted for a first offense DUI, you could be forced to serve at least two days in jail or 20 hours community service. That is what the bill says now. Now that bill has not been passed by the Senate. It is in the Appropriations Committee because it has money in it because there's going to be a financial impact uh, because of the mandatory uh, jail term that's included. And there was an interesting discussion on the Senate floor about essentially trying to weigh the demand uh, for stronger penalties for driving under the influence. And this this demand has, has been pushed along by some some horrible atrocities that have occurred on our roads where we, you know, had a West Fargo family uh, slaughtered by a drunk driver. We had two young boys who were camping in Lake Mitagoshi and were run over by a drunk driver and killed. And these, then these accidents happened last July within days of each other. And this generated, frankly, a lot of outrage and, and justifiably so. But uh, Senator Kelly Armstrong of Dickinson, he's a, he's a freshman Republican and also a, uh, a defense attorney who has handled a number of DUI cases. He says you have to you acknowledge the, the fact that folks are demanding stronger penalties, but you also have to be practical in terms of what the stronger penalties entail in terms of the need to spend for more jail space, the need to, to have more prosecutors, because if, if, if someone... Uh, is facing a mandatory jail term for a DUI, chances are they're not going to plea bargain. They're going to want a trial, and and, uh, this makes for good business for defense lawyers and prosecutors. And uh, so you have to sort of balance the... You have to... There's lots of different ways, I think, to reach the goal of of deterring drunken driving. And and they think that they, they, the Senate, think that they have a good strategy, and we'll see how it works out. The original bill was quite a bit different. It had a, an element of, of uh, well, for one thing, if you had a DUI conviction, you had a special driver's license so people could see that you were a person who had been, was convicted of DUI. And also there was uh, the requirement to install an ignition interlock device on your vehicle if you were uh, convicted. So you essentially you have to pass a breath test to drive. Uh, and those, those elements have been removed in favor of the, the elements that I mentioned. Uh, if you're at 0.18 or, or greater, you have to spend at least two days in jail or 20 hours community service. There's also a quite an, an integration of what's called the 24-7 sobriety program, which uh, means that you either have to wear a device on your ankle that can test you to see if you've been drinking, or you have to submit to twice daily tests at your uh, local constabulary uh, to see whether you've been drinking. Um, those were the, the, the major things that happened uh, uh, today in the legislature. And we have with us today, we're going to be talking about ethanol. We're going to talk about ethanol's impact on the North Dakota economy and uh, the market conditions of ethanol right now with the price of corn and the price of fuel, the price of gasoline, I should say. Uh, our guests are with the, the North Dakota Ethanol Council. They're both uh, active in the ethanol industry. We have uh, Mr. Jeff Zuger, who is the general manager of Blue Flint Ethanol, which is uh, a plant next to the Coal Creek uh, power station up by Underwood. And the significance of that uh, we'll explain in a moment. And we also have Dina Weezy, who is the uh, executive director of the North Dakota Ethanol Council. And a, she uh, works as a lobbyist for the industry in, in the legislature. Uh, welcome, uh, Ms. Weezy and uh, Mr. Zuger. 
Mr. Zuger, could you please tell us tell us about the Blue Flint plant and uh, tell us about the significance of, of its location next to the Coal Creek Station and how that helps your operation? Sure, I'd be glad to do that. Um, uh, Blue Flint ethanol is unique in the fact that it's co-located near Coal Creek Station, which is a 1,200 megawatt uh, coal-fired power plant. And the, the idea came from Great River Energy's engineering group looking for ways to use unused energy in the power production process. So as uh, they were developing uh, what some folks may be familiar with, the coal drying process uh, that they've developed recently up there, they were continuing to look for ways to use low-grade energy. And uh, at the time, ethanol uh, production was in kind of a rapid expansion. The renewable fuel standard was in development. And when we started looking at uh, pairing up that energy with ethanol production, it was just a natural fit. Uh, so when you, when you combine the two, you end up with a, a ethanol that's produced with a much lower carbon intensity because you're using energy that was unusable in its previous form. So we uh, moved ahead and, and uh, uh, built the project up there, but found that there were a lot of other benefits to co-locating a project like this when you create kind of an energy center or an energy park. Uh, you can take advantage of all of the utility infrastructures. Coal Creek Station, for example, had rail infrastructure, um, had electrical infrastructure, had fire protection infrastructure, water treatment infrastructure. That really lends itself to ethanol production at a lower cost, so making uh, the ethanol production more viable, more competitive in the marketplace. And then again, leads to a, a lower carbon intensity for the fuel because you're using what's unusable energy uh, in uh, in its current form. So it's lent itself well. We started the, that facility up in February of 2007 and uh, have been in full operations ever since. We produce today about 65 million gallons a year of ethanol. And uh, we sell E85 directly from that facility. We sell uh, both a modified distiller's grain and a, and a dry distiller's grain. And uh, we also produce uh, crude corn oil that goes into biodiesel production. What uh, sort of, what is the market situation for ethanol right now, uh, Mr. Zagor or Ms. Weezy? Well, uh, the, the market for ethanol is, is uh, dependent upon gasoline supply and, and the ability to move uh, ethanol into the fuel supply stream. So kind of some of the base for uh, ethanol demand is set by the Renewable Fuel Standard. So the Energy Independent Security Act of 2007 set a course for our, our nation to blend in up to 36 billion gallons of renewable fuel by 2022. That sets some of what is the baseline for, for ethanol demand. Today, uh, for 2013, the RFS standard, Renewable Fuel Standard, has set a demand of 13.8 billion gallons of ethanol to be blended with gasoline in a gasoline market that's about 130 billion gallons. So therein lies a little bit of uh, a challenge that we can talk about maybe as it relates to hitting what's called the blend wall because E10 is uh, the most commonly accepted and most commonly used uh, ethanol blend uh, while E30 and E85 and higher level blends and E15 are uh, available in, in some form or fashion, they're not as readily available and as highly used as E10. So uh, the market is really, uh, really threefold. The renewable fuel standard sets sets uh, kind of the base standard. Uh, just the market itself, meaning ethanol is lower priced than gasoline. If you look historically, ethanol is lower priced than gasoline today. It's about 60 cents cheaper per gallon. And then it also provides benefits that uh, that are unique in, in the fact that it has an higher, higher octane. So it, it lends itself towards bringing the octane levels up in gasoline, and it's used as an oxygenate. So that's really how eth ethanol production really took off was to replace MTBE, which used to be the oxygenate in fuel. That kind of set the standard for about 4 to 6 billion gallons of ethanol, and today we're producing... Uh, this year will have produced a little over 13 billion gallons of ethanol in our nation. Tell us what an oxygenate is. What does that mean? Uh, it provides additional oxygen to the fuel so that when the fuel is burned, you end up with lower emissions. Ms. Weezy, what sort of bills are the le is the legislature handling this year that affect the ethanol industry? What, what, what is it that you're following? 
Sure. Um, this year we're looking at securing permanent funding for the Renewable Energy Council. Uh, we're looking for uh, $3 million in funding for that. Um, uh, the North Dakota Empower Commission, which is made up of representatives from all of North Dakota's energy sectors, um, they have endorsed uh, a bill um, to have 5% with a, a maximum cap of $3 million from the Resource Trust Fund to get, uh, to fund the North Dakota Renewable Energy Council. And is that what you mean by permanent funding? Correct, you, you yes. Want, we'd get a share of, from the Resources Trust Fund? Correct, yep. And... Um, that that's been um, very going very well, um, as you're probably aware. Historically, the Resources Trust Fund has been used for water projects ac across the state. Uh, the the dollar amount in the fund has has escalated recently, and the water community um, is actually supportive of using um, a percentage of that for for renewable energy. Is that the primary bill that you're you're? Shepherding here. Yes, that is that's the primary bill. Um, there's also uh, included in that bill is three hundred thousand for a study to identify the most pro promising um, opportunities for the future of renewable fuels or renewable energy. Actually, including you know that might include wind um, as well as as ethanol or next generation ethanol as well. I, I'd like you both to address the next question if you don't mind. Uh, one of the things that is interesting about when you go through the production statistics for the ethanol plants in North Dakota is they produce not only ethanol, but a, a large amount of distiller's grain. And what is done with this distiller's grain? Because it seems like you're making a lot more of it than there are cattle to feed it to in North Dakota. Sure, I can start uh, with that. We produce uh, over a million tons of distillers grains in North Dakota with the current production rates that the plants are running at. And it, it really is a high value feed. Uh, it's valuable in a lot of rations beyond just cattle feed, but it, it moves into poultry and swine and, and all of the feed markets. Could, could, I, could you explain why is it high value feed? Why is it a good quality feed? Essentially, we're corn processing facilities. We remove the starch from the corn and, the, and what's left, the, the protein and fiber and, and other nutrients in the corn are still left over after we remove the starch. So the ethanol is just, uh, the ethanol production process just removes the starch, converts that starch to sugar, and then ferments the sugar into alcohols. What's left then is the other nutrients in the corn. So you have a high value feed at that point. So we've taken the starch out brought the protein levels up so you get about a 25 percent protein product that can be sold in a dry or wet form and mixed in with different feed rations it also transports well uh, and, and like I say mi mixes well with a lot of different feed rations so where is it being used where's the products that we're producing in North Dakota being used unfortunately the majority of them are being exported so we, we could uh, certainly expand the use of, of feed in North Dakota. That's a strong opportunity for our state. Uh, there's there's a, a lot of cost to ship these products you know, over land to, to destinations. So, for example, our products, if it's not uh, sold within a, a local 50, 75 mile radius to a feed uh, facility, it goes into a rail car and goes into Canadian feed markets. Uh, some of the other plants will move to the east coast or west coast or, or uh, other areas with their rail uh, moving product. So there's still a large part of our product that's exported out of the state. So there's a huge opportunity there for our industry to work with, with the feed industry to take advantage of this high value feed that we're producing. Ms. Weezy, is there, do you know of anything that's being done to take advantage of the fact that we have an enormous feed supply in North Dakota and... Uh, maybe fewer cattle to feed it to than we uh, would like to have. Well, I know the, the beef industry has recognized that their production numbers are decreasing significantly across the state. So, you know, they're initiating efforts just to increase their, their numbers. Um, we've also been in discussions with um, the North Dakota corn growers, um, and we just had a meeting a couple weeks ago with... Um, uh, Commissioner Doug Goring, Egg Commissioner for the state, on you know how right now currently 80 to 90 percent of our DDGs are exported out of state. So how can we begin education efforts with our you know our North Dakota farmers and ranchers on 
uh, feeding that? Kind of what are the strategies? So, uh, you know, probably within the next year or so, we'll probably be looking at opportunities to address just that. Um, also wanted to mention um, in regard to, to DDGs, um, you know, about 40% of the of corn is used for ethanol, but when you factor in the amount that's returned back in uh, in the form of of dry distillers or distillers grain, the high you know value feed for livestock, it's only about 26 percent. So when you factor in that third that's returned to the as a livestock feed, it's returned to the food chain, less. in other exactly. words. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Let's let's talk let's talk about that. There is an argument that the ethanol production somehow drives up the price of food and 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 there's the, the, the arguments made that there's something almost inherently wrong with taking corn and making fuel out of it instead of feeding it to livestock or feeding it to human beings uh, could you just talk about both of you talk about how you uh, deal with that uh, assertion yeah you know the ethanol industry was essentially created out of need for for uh, adding value to agriculture. So we had uh, pro- uh, products that uh, farmers were being incented, incented not to produce. So taking land out of production to not produce crops to try and help balance the, the market prices for, for crops. The ethanol industry has brought about a demand for, for corn, which has overall helped the agricultural industry. Uh, so when you look at essentially f- food versus fuel, uh, y- you got to look at a much bigger picture than just taking uh, some corn and using it for fuel. Ultimately, ethanol drives down energy costs, drives down fuel costs, which have a much bigger impact than the core commodity does on, on uh, uh, grocery products that, that the consumer sees in the end. We're, we'll, uh, we'll return to this subject uh, in our next uh, segment. Uh, we have with us uh, this evening uh, Dina Weezy, who is the communications, uh, the executive director of the North Dakota Ethanol Council. We have Mr. Jeff Zuger, the chairman of the North Dakota Ethanol Council and the general manager of Blue Flint Ethanol, which is an ethanol factory near Underwood in west central North Dakota. Welcome back to the legislature today. This is Gary Emmett is with your host, Dale Wetzel. We've Happy been, Valentine's Day, Gary. Hey, Dale, thank you. Same to you. We need to greet our guests and give them the same because they're away from their um, wives and husbands as well this evening. I assume, I don't know if you guys are married. I didn't ask you earlier. Are you both married? So Yes. Do you have children? Are your children, um, how old yes. are your children, Jeff? I have an 18-year-old daughter and a 26-year-old stepson. Okay. How about you, Dina? Three-year-old little boy that's... Hopefully, bathed and in bed. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Wine on ice. So, if you did a, hopefully, Dad did a good job. <laughs> we have with us this evening uh, Dina Weezy of the North Dakota Ethanol Council. She is the executive director. We also have Mr. Jeff Zuger, the general manager of Blue Flint Ethanol and chairman of the North Dakota Ethanol Council. Mr. Zuger, uh, before we went to our break, uh, we were talking about uh, essentially the food versus fuel argument. Uh, to what extent is is there even an argument to be made that uh, using corn to make fuel somehow drives up the price of food? I mean, what do you, what do you think about that? The logic of that? Yeah, uh, essentially, there's little to no correlation between ethanol expansion and food price inflation. Food pr- price inflation has been in the two to three percent in through the two thousands. You know, in the eighties, it was. Uh, much higher than that, 70s even higher than that. So there's essentially study after study that shows there's really no correlation between this onset of additional ethanol production in our country and the price of food. And when you get to uh, the the retail level, what a consumer pays for for a food product, only about 15% of that is made up from the core commodity, and about 85% of that is made up of additional com- things that go into it, a large part of which is energy. And I think the the, uh, the benefit of the ethanol industry is that it drives down energy costs because it is a renewable component added into the to the energy supply stream to help offset our nation's uh, energy needs, and it's it's produced at a lower cost than gasoline. So it it helps drive down gasoline price by as much as a dollar a gallon, and that's proven to have a, a bigger impact than the core commodity price uh, does on food products. 
We were talking earlier about. I'm, I'm sorry, Ms. Weeks. Oh, I was just going to add something too, if I might. You know, the corn acres too over the, the past decade have increased significantly. The the yield on the same number of acres, uh, you know, due to technology and genetic advancements. Um, I I think the statistics say that you know last year's corn crop, even with the drought in the Midwest, was the second largest um, historically world world corn crop. So uh, the amount, the yield that's able to be produced on the same acreage um, has just significantly increased. Dale, I recall when we had the corn growers on, wasn't a number, um, I think they said something like it was 90 bushels an acre, it's up to 130. I was thinking it's up almost 50% on the yield through the technology advancements that occurred because of yeah. the ethanol. And obviously, you got a lot, a lot, a lot of smiling farmers, you know, because for years, I think what I thought was very interesting that gets lost in it, a lot of sons or daughters maybe wanted to come back to the farm and farm with mom and dad, mm-hmm. and the income wasn't there. The farmers, they were all struggling. In fact, now you're seeing the economy's thriving because of egg, and I don't, I don't think we should forget that either, you know, because that's an important part of our economy, our number one se- inter- segment in our industry, North Dakota, is egg. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of good to see them thriving, so I, just, yes. I think it gets lost sometimes. Yes, yeah, yep. that's true. You hear story after story about the next generation either moving back or able to stay. Yeah. Ms. Weezy, um, we were talking earlier about the North Dakota Ethanol Council, of which you are the director. Can you tell us what is the North Dakota Ethanol Council? Who are the members of it, and what does it do? Sure. The North Dakota Ethanol Council was established in uh, 2009 uh, by the North Dakota legislature to promote the state's ethanol industry. It's uh, made up of the four plants across the state, um, Red Trail Energy in Richardson, Blue Flint Ethanol in, in Underwood, Tharaldson Ethanol in Castleton, and Hankinson Renewable Energy in Hankinson, North Dakota. Um, it's the first ever ethanol checkoff program in the nation. Um, so again, uh, the foresight of, of industry and, and North Dakota's government. Um, Could you explain what a checkoff is, please? Sure. The, each ethanol plant, plant uh, pays a three one hundredths of one cent assessment per gallon of ethanol that they produce. So it's a produce ethanol producer funded um, council, uh, similar to the other egg commodity councils across the state. And what's the money used for? Sure, it's used for uh, you know industry research and promotion, educational programs really f- uh, focus on market development, uh, just. Uh, enhancing North Dakota's ethanol industry. What happens with the ethanol that gets manufactured in North Dakota? Is it used in North Dakota? Is it shipped elsewhere? Could you just talk about that? I'll let Jeff. Sure. <laughs> Mr. Zuger. Yeah. Please. Unfortunately, we, we don't have the capacity to use all of the production that we uh, produce in the state. So we produce about 400 uh, million gallons of ethanol in the state, uh, which is more than the entire amount of gasoline that we're consuming in the state. So if you if you look at uh, the ratios, they just don't work. Wow. We're just not a, a high enough density population. So uh, we're, we're, I think the latest numbers were about 26 million gallons of ethanol used in the state, uh, some of which ends up as E85. A lot of it uh, ends up in E10 blends. Um, the rest is exported. Uh, it's exported to large uh, uh, markets where there's high population, and, and uh, it's exported to terminals and distributed then into the fuel supply chain. Uh, products from Blue Flint are exported actually into Canadian fuel markets. So uh, most of our fuel that we produce, if it doesn't go out by truck, if it goes out by rail, it's going into British Columbia or Alberta, Canada. Uh, what? I'm sorry, go ahead. There, there you know, have been... Uh, efforts in North Dakota to increase the consumption uh, throughout the state. The Ethanol Council, Corn Growers, and American Lun Association um, have have partnered on a marketing effort to inform uh, consumers about mid-level ethanol blends with the ultimate goal of increasing ethanol consumption in North Dakota. And um, E85 sales have more than tripled, and total ethanol blended fuel sales have increased by more than 20% since 2009. So, the um, the, um, a large part of that, too, is due to the North Dakota Blender Pump Program, which has um, established mid-level blends at more than uh, 40 retailers across across North Dakota. Can you explain what is a blender pump? Want to take that one, Jeff? Sure. Uh, a blender pump is actually, it, it looks like a, a pump at a retail fuel station. 
but it, it has a capacity to blend a multiple fuels into a finished product, so into a certified finished product. So you can take tank A, tank B of two different types of fuels, in this case E85 and gasoline, and you can blend it to anything in between gasoline and E85. So you can, one of the nozzles can dispense gasoline, one of them E10, one of them E20, E30, whatever blend is set up in the blender pump up to E85, which is in, in the other tank. So it allows uh, retailers to buy ethanol blended products directly from the producer. So facilities like ourselves and other ethanol production facilities can sell directly to the, to the retailer. Uh, they then can blend that into a multitude of blends. So uh, anything from E10 all the way up to E85 and offer consumers a, a low cost choice on a multitude of, of blends Primarily, you see E10, E30, and E85 because E30 is a, is a very high economic return for a lower-cost fuel. So this, why, why is that? Can you explain why E30 is a particular good choice? Yeah, the, the engines that are built today don't necessarily have the, uh, uh, the design in mind to take advantage of the higher octane of E85. So when you add E85, it has a little bit lower energy density, but it has a higher octane. So as you blend these gasoline and ethanol products together, E30 tends to be a lower cost product because of the lower cost component of ethanol and still is able to maintain the fuel mileage of, of a regular gasoline. So you get the economics of a lower cost ethanol blended fuel and the mileage of, of, uh, of more of a gasoline blended fuel. Now, if you start to move into vehicles that take advantage of the characteristics of ethanol, you can move the mileage per gallon up, uh, which is where we, we'd like to see us go with our nation's uh, motor supply. If I'm, if I'm sitting here and I'm thinking, well, I've got a reasonably new car, how can I figure out whether I can use ethanol fuel? What, what would you suggest that I do? How, how does a motorist figure out whether their car can handle uh, E30 or E85, for example? Sure. You, you know, the, the easiest way is to look in your owner's manual. That'll, of course, say it. But most of the new vehicles, it's indicated on the fuel cap as well. Yeah, as you'll also a lot of times see badging on the external mm-hmm. component of the vehicle that says flex fuel capable. But uh, if you, if you uh, go to your fuel uh, fill uh, cap, and it, it typically will say flex fuel or be a yellow cap. And there, there currently are about uh, 65 or 64,500 flex fuel vehicles on North Dakota roads um, today, and that's about 125% increase since 2008. So um, manufacturers are turning out increased number of flex fuel vehicles. Um, so, you know, our efforts are focused on making sure that the uh, consumers know that they have those and that mid-level ethanol blends are um, compatible and beneficial to uh, fuel their vehicle. Does state government subsidize the ethanol industry in North Dakota? And uh, if so, how? Sure. Uh, the, the North Dakota state government set up a counter-cyclical program as an incentive to try and uh, get plants to locate in the state. So uh, as the ethanol industry was expanding, states were looking at uh, various means of incenting or trying to uh, get plants to locate because of the strong economic impact that these plants have. Uh, our state looked at uh, and developed a counter-cyclical program that essentially uh, offers ethanol production facilities uh, the, the ability to potentially gain uh, payment if the relationship between the price of corn and the price of ethanol is such that the facility would naturally not be in a profitable mode. So there is the North Dakota Countercyclical Program, which is very unique in the country, that uh, the state set aside dollars that come from uh, farm vehicle registration uh, renewals. Uh, a portion of that is set aside every year as a funding mechanism. And if the markets are such that, that an ethanol production facility would need incentives, there are incentives in place for the first 10 years of production or up to $10 million per facility. Are, are market conditions such that that money is being drawn upon right now? They have been. Uh, there have been times when they have not been drawn upon and the fund continues to grow. 
and there are uh, uh, times when the funds have been distributed through the ethanol production. What is the situation now? Well, uh, the funds actually flow into that funding mechanism once a year. So uh, the funds that uh, came in in uh, uh, third quarter of 2012 uh, the economics were such in 2012 that those funds were distributed to the ethanol production facilities. I mean, with, with the price of corn presently, um, is it difficult to make a profit making ethanol? I mean, what, can you just explain what, is, what are your ideal market conditions for, for making money uh, making ethanol? And, sure. and how that differs or doesn't differ from what, the way things are right now? Sure. Well, 2012 was a challenging year for the ethanol industry uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, we came into 2012 with a large ethanol stock, a large amount of inventory, uh, because of a, a federal credit that went away at the end of 2011 caused a lot of production facilities to ramp up and produce as many gallons. So we were carrying a large amount of stocks. 2012 brought uh, reduced gasoline demand year over year. And then with carrying these heavy stocks, we, we saw what, what is now an unprecedented drought. We haven't seen a drought like this in, in over 50 years that has caused high corn prices. Uh, the, the, probably the most notable thing, though, through all of this is that corn, corn at $7, we're still able, able to produce ethanol today at $0.60 cents cheaper a gallon than gasoline. So there's, there's dynamics in the marketplace Number one, its relationship to the price of gasoline will help determine its profitability. Um, supply and demand. So do suppliers, uh, are, are they oversupplying the market demand? But really what we're running into now is this blend wall. So you've got these these amount of gallons that can go into the marketplace, and we need to expand our market. So we're producing a product that's lower priced than, than our competitive uh, uh, market uh, component, but we can't expand into the market because of this blend wall at E10. We need E15 and these higher level blends to allow these products to flow into the market to allow profitability uh, to, to resume and, and become more robust at these facilities. Could you please elaborate a bit on what, what is a blend wall? What does that term mean? Well, yeah, it's a term that describes uh, essentially when 10% of, of uh, your ethanol product. 10% of your fuel supply is supplied with the current production capacity of ethanol. So if we've got 130 billion gallon gasoline demand and you're producing 13 billion gallons of ethanol and you can, you can put 10% ethanol into the fuel supply, you've kind of hit the wall. Beyond that, you've got to get E15 Im implemented into the marketplace or expand into these E30, E85 markets so you have more room for that ethanol to go into these markets. Is Sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just going to say, North Dakota really is a leader in the establishment of flex fuel pumps. There's uh, or, you know, nearly 200 pumps in more than 40 communities, um, but that infrastructure doesn't exist nation, nationwide. Um, so that exp so mid-level blends are available in North Dakota and are being used successfully here, uh, but that's not the case nationwide. What is being done to increase ethanol demand, the demand for ethanol blended fuels in other places where it may not be as readily available as it is here? Well, our industry is, you know, continually... Uh, trying to implement the E15 uh, uh, requirements. So the EPA uh, uh, passed a, an allowance that says E15 is a viable fuel for 2001 newer vehicles. Uh, there's other challenges, though, along the way, is getting all of the infrastructure at these retail fuel stations certified to dispense E15. So that's really the battle that we're uh, waging at this point, is to try and ensure that retailers can, can dispense this fuel that we can produce by way of E15. And then we're additionally working on these higher level blends for flex fuel vehicle owners. There's about 10 million flex fuel vehicles in our, in our nation, and if we can uh, create um, or, or rather distribution points like we've done in North Dakota to allow these folks the choice of higher level blends, that too brings additional opportunity for ethanol to come into the marketplace. To what extent uh, do you have competition from foreign ethanol? I'm thinking about 
ethanol that's made from sugar. Uh, there was a bit of a dust up about ethanol imports and you know ethanol from Brazil. What is the situation presently in the market uh, in terms of do you have competition from imported ethanol and to what extent does it affect your market? Yeah. Sure. Uh, the renewable fuel standard is uh, the cornerstone of renewable fuels and ethanol's demand, and it, it's kind of the, the laid the groundwork. It has components in it, though, for advanced biofuels, and, and advanced biofuels, unfortunately, the way the law was written, cannot come from cornstarch because of the concern for food versus fuel. Uh, it, it, it has components in it that talk about indirect land use and not to get too far into the weeds. But Brazilian ethanol doesn't carry those components with it because of the way that we're evaluating how it's produced. I understand they want to make ethanol out of the weeds, too. Yes. We're talking about weeds. <laughs> Absolutely. So, essentially, Brazilian ethanol meets the advanced fuel standards that are created by the, the RFS, the Renewable Fuel Standard. It meets the need for obligated parties to to uh, be able to meet that need with with uh, Brazilian ethanol so it is an it's considered an advanced biofuel so inherently it has a little bit higher value than the ethanol that we produce from cornstarch so we have seen uh, record Brazilian imports this year and that too has put pressure on as we've seen ethanol production facilities in our country slow down and shut down most of that slowdown and shutdown, because I mentioned earlier the high inventories that we have, have been offset by Brazilian imports because of the renewable fuel standard really drawing those gallons to our nation's fuel supply. To what extent is, I mean, we, we hear a lot of talk about, uh, uh, I guess I'd call them more exotic forms of uh, feedstock for ethanol, such as wood chips and switchgrass and other, sorts, other sources of starch and cellulose. Uh, are those? Um, do you, are you concerned about those as a source of competition, or is it too much of a nascent industry to worry about at this point? You know, there's a significant amount of research going on. Um, I'll let Jeff touch on that because uh, you know, well, some of the plants across the nation, as you mentioned, are shutting down. North Dakota is actually looking at. Uh, opening up another facility and you know some of the plants in that are along the lines of advanced biofuel into the future um, so just bringing that to commercialization um, it, it's still being worked on but I'll let Jeff touch on that yeah you know we're going to see additional cellulosic gallons come on this year we're going to continue to see uh, ethanol producers figure out a way to make their fuel advanced if whether that's uh producing something uh, that's maybe a little bit different than ethanol or using an alternative feedstock that can get you to an advanced. Uh, so I think that we'll, we'll kind of, the market will solve these problems. The ethanol industry will solve some of these challenges. Cellulosic ethanol has been de delayed. Uh, it, it's been a bit more challenging than, than uh, the industry thought uh, to get uh, to, to turn cellulose into uh, alcohol. But we're getting there. There's facilities that are coming online in 2013 that will produce uh, cellulosic ethanol. And that's really what it takes to get the industry up and going, is to get these first production facilities up, get their production costs down. And from there, I think you'll see a, a pretty rapid expansion uh, of the cellulosic piece. And that's where you're really taking what is unusable components of, a, a, of, of biomass and turning it into high-value fuel. To what extent do the North Dakota plants that are operating now have a competitive advantage over others elsewhere in the country? I mean, Mr. Zuger, you mentioned uh, how the affiliation or the closeness to the to the Coal Creek plant uh, gives you a certain economic advantages. Are there other economic advantages that the other plants have that uh, that you can discuss? Mm -hmm. You know, Tharlson Ethanol, I think they're a great example, too. They're using a wastewater from the city of Fargo um, in their process and returning a cleaner product than they're, than they're getting. Um, the plants in North Dakota are very technologically advanced, state-of-the-art. Um, so North Dakota's really kind of um, stepped up to the plate in that regard. Yeah, I think each plant has its own strategic advantages when you talk about, for example, Red Trail. 
they they combust coal in their in their boiler and that gives them stable fuel input costs so each plant kind of has its own uh, niche uh, as a strategic advantage but i think one of the things in 2013 north dakota did not see the drought that the rest of the nation has seen so the the Corn production acres uh, are dramatically up in 2013. You know, we're over 400 million bushels of corn produced, almost doubled our corn production year over year. So that is a strong advantage for these production facilities in 2013 is corn readily available in our supply area as opposed to plants that are south and east of us that are going to have to try and figure out a way to bring this corn into them. To what extent has the ethanol industry benefited North Dakota's agricultural economy in general? You know, North, or ethanol is a rural economic development uh, success story. Each one of the plants is located in communities under, pop, under the population of 2,500. And, you know, they contribute on the average 50 jobs and 3.3 million in payroll in those communities annually. Yeah, I think uh, we're not like as big a footprint at these facilities as you tend to think of a... Uh, a power plant or a mine that has several hundred employees, but we have a large multiplier on indirect jobs. So, you know, up to 10,000 indirect jobs in the state of North Dakota uh, from ethanol production and over $650 million worth of direct economic impact to the state. We've been speaking this evening to uh, Mr. Jeff Zuger, whose voice you just heard. He is the chairman of the North Dakota Ethanol Council and the general manager of Blue Flint Ethanol, which is one of four ethanol plants in North Dakota that produces, what, approximately 400 million gallons uh, of ethanol uh, each uh, year and uh, consumes a great deal of corn. We've also been speaking to Ms. Dina Weezy, who is the executive director of the North Dakota Ethanol Council. Uh, this hour has been sponsored by the North Dakota Ethanol Council. <coughs> and, sorry about that. And um, and thank you, thank you both for uh, for being with us this evening. It's been very educational. Thank you. Thank you.